If you want to know how cities get built, but only look at city planning, you're really missing out on half the story. City planners can assign land uses to parcels all they want, but it doesn't mean anything is going to get built there. You need real estate developers attuned to the market to have a vision for the property and see it become a reality. If you look at it from a developer's point of view, you can think of it as a game, maybe a board game. Developers are doing their best to navigate obstacles to reach their goal, a completed project. They have to do a market analysis to understand what development would be a good fit, and then find a promising piece of land in a great location. Ideally, that property doesn't need environmental remediation or pose other challenges. Most developers do not have all the funding they need and must sell that vision to investors. Now that's only the beginning. Developers need to do due diligence to ensure their idea is compatible with local laws and zoning codes. They need to receive their entitlements from local government before beginning construction. They'll also need construction loans, which are separate from investor financing and a standard commercial mortgage. Developers will have to enlist contractors to build the structures and must avoid the pitfalls of labor shortages, rising materials costs, and other construction delays. They'll have to market the project to potential tenants and buyers. Once the project is complete, they hope that the costs associated with building the project are less than the profits from the project, either rents or sales. The bank will want their share of the investment first, followed by the equity partners. In some cases, the real estate developer doesn't even get paid until their investors get their promised percentage return on investment. It's a challenging game, which is why city planners need to consider the hurdles they put in front of real estate developers before a project gets built. Lengthy approval processes, development fees, public hearings, confusing zoning codes can all mean the difference between a project getting built and a vacant lot. I've done like 150 videos on city planning, so let's do one on real estate development and uncover its secrets after the bike bell. The first thing to know about real estate development that there are different product types, like commercial, industrial, and residential. Many developers specialize in one of those. And even within those categories exist specializations. Some developers develop the land by purchasing a property, subdividing lots, installing utilities, and then selling those lots to home builders, while others do all of that and build the homes themselves. Furthermore, real estate developers tend to focus on one geographic area. This helps the developer understand the local market, and develop connections with brokers, lenders, and investors. I think it's best to explain the real estate development process by taking you through an example project. We're going to have to keep it hypothetical because it's hard to find developers willing to take you through an actual project and open up the spreadsheets and go into their trade secrets. I understand it's a competitive business. So we'll keep it hypothetical, but plausible for this video. In this video, we're going to be multifamily housing developers. All developers, regardless of specialty, need to start at project feasibility. Step one is to conduct a market analysis before purchasing a property. They need to understand what is missing in the market and if that parcel can help fill that need. Our home territory is San Luis Obispo, California, my current hometown, and a city with quite a few jobs but not enough housing. Our market analysis will go quite a bit deeper to understand the socioeconomic characteristics of the local population, typical rents, and other competing developments. Based on our hypothetical market analysis, we know that a small multifamily building could be built in San Luis Obispo and rented out fairly quickly with fairly high rents. The next step is to find a suitable site. Most developers begin by looking for locations that their target market would prefer. If they're marketing to families, property in preferred school districts might be the best option, for example. We are going to get too detailed here. We're targeting middle and upper income couples and small families, and a lot just about anywhere would work fine. And as we look, here's one vacant and for sale. We still need to do our due diligence on this property and check out environmental issues that need remediation, access to utilities and utility capacity for new development, and explore planning issues. The zoning code will tell us lots of important things, like how tall the building can be and how much of the lot can it cover. Our hypothetical parcel is in an R4 high density residential zone, which allows 24 dwelling units per acre. Our parcel is 1.4 acres, so that means that we can build 33 units the building can take up 60% of the lot maximum and be no higher than 35 feet tall. Okay, so we've determined that there's a market for multifamily housing here in San Luis Obispo, and we found a parcel that could be a perfect fit. Now we need to figure out if we can make any money by building this project. It's time for the financial analysis. It typically starts with a simple pro forma statement to see if this project would pencil out and gets more detailed as the process continues and more details get nailed down. We're doing apartments, so we need to figure out the costs and revenues during the development period from this part now where we're doing the feasibility analysis until the project is built in 90 to 95% leased out. Then we need to know if it will be profitable during the operating period, where it's just an apartment building generating rent. As the financial analysis gets more detailed, we can start moving into the design step. Before we hand the project off to architects, we need to make some decisions. What kind of building will we build? 
Podium style construction with more than seven or eight stories is quite expensive per unit due to the fire code requirements. We also can't build that because it would exceed zoning height limits. We could look into a three over one style podium mid-rise structure. It might be too tight to construct with our height limits, but three over one, four over one, and five over one buildings are extremely common types of multifamily housing. They're called that because they're made up of three, four, or five wood-framed combustible construction over a one floor concrete podium. Any sort of common urban apartment in your city is probably this type of building. The most affordable option and the best fit based on the zoning code is a garden apartment. These are typically three stories as that height doesn't require expensive elevators. They're also completely wood frame too, further reducing costs. We also need to figure out unit mix. Will this be designed for college students with three and four bedroom floor plans designed to be split amongst roommates? Or will it be micro units and studios or senior housing? I think for this project, let's stick with a typical mix of one, two, and three bedroom apartments. We also need to decide on amenities, which comes from our market analysis. Do we need granite countertops and in-unit laundry? Or will our target market not be able to afford them? And do we need a clubhouse and pool as shared amenities? As we're aiming for a mid-range market and have a smaller lot, eh, let's not have a pool. But let's add in-unit laundry as families really prefer that amenity. And that's what the competition is offering at this price point. Okay, so now we have a market analysis, a site, a financial analysis, and a design. We need to find some money to make this project happen. Most of the time, developers rely on bank loans and investor equity to pay for these projects. We're first gonna go to a bank and get a loan that will finance about 60% of the project, including the acquisition of the property. That's right, up until now, we didn't actually even own the property and we were doing all of that due diligence. We will also seek a construction loan to pay for the cost of actually building the apartments. Construction loans are usually short, often just a year, and dispersed monthly instead of in one lump sum. We're also going to get some individual investors to take us to 100% of the cost of the project. We'll need to pay off our loans before we pay our investors, and if we don't have enough money, we may need to get more from our investors. That's obviously not ideal, as they're looking for a certain return on investment. One of the most important things to understand is that delays in unforeseen circumstances cost money. That's why so much time is spent upfront doing the due diligence to make sure that there are fewer bumps in the road. With our funding secured and our property acquired, we can start construction. This is actually one of the most straightforward parts of the process, assuming everything else has gone well so far. We'll find a general contractor and work with them to ensure that the project is done on time and within our budget. Like I said, Delays cost money and we don't want that. At the same time, we need to begin the marketing and leasing process. We need to let people know that they can rent an apartment here. These days, 95% of our marketing budget will be spent on digital media. We'll buy ads, set up a website, and use social media to promote our project. We will also do some on-site marketing. We'll set aside a couple of model units for people to check out. Our marketing budget will be about $1,000 per unit, and that number would be higher if we were doing luxury or high-rise apartments. If we think we're in a competitive market, we could offer concessions to the renters, like free cable or first month rent free. It's a tight rental market though, so let's try without those. With our marketing successful and our project constructed, we're ready to move on to the operation phase of the project. We're gonna use the rents that we collect every month to pay off our debt and equity financing, as well as pay for property management. Now, some real estate developers manage properties themselves, while some hire out to a property management firm. Since our project is so small, it makes more sense to hire out a company that manages multiple properties. Projects typically need 150 to 200 units to support a full-time dedicated on-site management staff, and we just don't have that. Now with our project developed, we need to consider our exit strategy. We could hold onto this property or sell it to a firm that specializes in operating apartment buildings. In this case, we'll sell and use the funds to pay off our debt, give our investors a nice return, and give us the money we need to keep our business running and hunt for another good development project. This was obviously an incredibly simplified version of the real estate development process, but even in this simplified example, you can see how incredibly complicated it is. There's so many people involved, from lenders to marketers to developers to property managers to maintenance workers and on and on. And one thing that's important to understand is that time is money. And the longer the process drags on, the more expensive it gets. This is a real concern, especially when we're developing affordable housing. If a project seems like it would have to go through an overly complicated local government review process, that project just may not happen at all. Or they may decide that the only kind of housing that pencils out is luxury apartments. So what can city planners do to make it easier for developers to build more housing? Local governments can reduce the amount of time required for project approval. Time is money and uncertainty can kill a project. Planning departments can increase the number of project types that can be approved at the staff level without getting planning commissioners and city council members involved. 
You don't want a Jeremy Jam weighing in if at all possible. Another thing cities can do is remove minimum parking requirements. This is all about letting the developers decide what the best amount of parking is. They've done the research and know how much parking their project needs, but the local government has this number that's sometimes arbitrary and often too high for the project. If we would just let developers build what they want to build, they could right-size the parking and have more lot area for housing. Local governments can offer density bonuses. This means that the developer can build more units than the zoning code allows, but the local government gets something back from the developer. Oftentimes, this is a guarantee that some of the units in the development will be affordable to low-income families. But density bonuses are also used for habitat conservation or to provide plazas or other public spaces. City planners need to balance the need for more housing and other types of development with the impact those developments will have on their community. Now, real estate development, as we saw, is extremely complex, but planners don't need to make it excessively complex. Real estate developers will tell you that they spend a fair amount of time staring at spreadsheets and doing math. They're just one of the many fields that rely on math and science on a daily basis. Luckily, getting or improving those skills has never been easier, thanks to Brilliant.org. Brilliant teaches you STEM topics in a low-stress environment, at your own pace, while still being incredibly effective. I'm a college professor, and the techniques Brilliant uses is absolutely backed up by the best practices in teaching. I honestly wish my university students used Brilliant, as they often complain about less-than-stellar lecture-based math and science classes. Brilliant is better because it doesn't lecture or have you memorize facts and formulas but it uses active learning techniques like interactive visuals and low stakes assessment to get you to really understand these complex topics. You're actually solving problems. And Brilliant almost certainly has a class you could benefit from. They have over 60 with thousands of lessons, including calculus, chemistry, and computer science with more added monthly. I'm telling you, their content is simple enough for anyone to jump in, quality enough for the university students I teach, and advanced enough for me to use when brushing up on topics like data science and statistics. To try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days, go visit brilliant.org slash citybeautiful. I left a link in the description and on screen. The first 200 of you will get 20% off an annual premium subscription.